So I hope that everyone had a nice lunch, whatever a nice lunch means to you. And uh, I certainly did. I was treated by Marianne to something delicious. <laughs> and uh, it only gets better really from here because the first link that we talked about this morning was that link from suffering to either old age, sickness and death and more suffering or confidence and hearing the Buddha's teachings and beginning to practice the path. And so only that first link, the very first one is the suffering. And from there on, once we're on the path, of course, we still go through ups and downs, but on the whole, we're starting to kind of come up a little bit. The downs are a bit less low than before and the ups get a little bit higher and perhaps more steady as well. And so um, this afternoon, I wanted to talk about the next link which is that link um, from suffering to confidence and also from the confidence and how that relates to joy. Um, and so we'll start there, shall we? So one of the other nice meanings of confidence to me is um, a sense of inspiration. And there's a Pali word, pasada, which uh, actually means confidence and inspiration together. And that word also means a sense of serenity because the confidence and the inspiration gives us that sense that, yeah, I'm on the right path. Right? I'm starting to get a sense for what it means to be here as a human being, um, a sense for the capacity I have to bring about happiness for myself and the true benefit of others as well. And some kind of inner security starts to arise in the mind, a sense of refuge, a sense of trust. I really like the word trust actually for confidence because trust is a verb, it's something we can do, we can trust ourselves, we can offer that trust to others. And uh, it's easy to see how when there's a lack of trust, everything falls apart. You know, if we can't trust one another here, we can't really enjoy the retreat, we can't relax enough to feel safe around one another. You know, if we can't trust ourselves, if we don't really trust that we kind of have what it takes or we have that seed of potential, that goodness in ourselves, then it's very, very hard to give ourselves opportunities to progress on the path or to thrive in any aspect of life. We need to have a certain level of trust and inspiration. And that gives our lives meaning. It gives them a sense of purpose and it gives us the confidence to take the next step. So the Buddha also spoke about confidence as being the opposite of skeptical doubt. There are different kinds of doubt and it's okay to question in Buddhism. It's in any religion, I hope, it's okay to question. In fact, it's essential to question, especially our teachers, especially people we maybe look up to. We have to make sure they're really, you know, practicing what they preach to some degree. They may not be enlightened yet and there are very few who are. But at least they're on the path, they're being honest, they're being um, open to scrutiny, open to being questioned on various aspects of the Dhamma. Because, you know, they shouldn't be there to impress, they should be there to help. So we have to be able to question. But if that doubt takes the form of a kind of scepticism or a cynicism that actually makes it very difficult to uh, know where to put our trust, then that can be an obstacle to taking a step on the path. We have to have enough confidence that if what we've practiced so far has had some results, perhaps the Buddha was right about the next step too. And it becomes a sort of um, a working hypothesis, if you like. So, okay, we don't understand, say, the law of karma fully. We understand our actions have effects, but we don't really understand how far they, those effects spread or why things are happening the way they are or perhaps future lives and that kind of thing. We, it, and it's good to keep that on hold, but not to dismiss it completely, to have it as an open hypothesis that can be tested and that can be verified through the path. So this kind of uh, sort of wise doubt, if you like, or, or mm, questioning and looking for verification, looking for the evidence, trying to uh, verify our beliefs through our own personal experience is a very powerful force on the path. And I don't know, maybe you know what it's like to have so much doubt that you just can't see a way forward. You don't know, you know, where to go next. Sometimes I think um, doubt manifests as confusion. 
you know, just being really unsure about a decision that you need to take. You just don't know what the right thing to do is. And at those times, sometimes it's better to wait until you have a little bit of trust, at least in your intention, to make a, a values-informed decision and to trust that you did your best. You know, you might not get the results you want, but at least you made that decision in good faith and, you know, with motivated by loving kindness, by compassionate concern for others and yourself. And then it's easier, isn't it, to um, accept where that leads and to make the best of it. Because we can't get everything right, but we can make the best of things in life. So it helps us to take that step. And in this particular sequence, it is a kind of... Um, it's a kind of chip in the system. Like when we hear the Buddha's teachings, we hear a different way and we start to look in a different direction and that starts things unraveling down a different path. And the Buddha actually said we start to um, see things differently. So for example, the confidence in the Buddha's teachings might um, help us to live a more virtuous life. We feel like, okay, I'm ready to give this a try. And because of that, we don't do the same things as other people. You know, we start to decide we don't want to go down to the pub. We don't think it's cool to kind of swagger around in the streets in the rain, <laughs> not knowing where we're going or, I don't know, evade the tickets on the train, which I'll tell you a story about later. <laughs> it doesn't seem so cool anymore. And your friends might think you're a bit weird, a bit nerdy or whatever. But actually, you have a different sense of um, a different place to get your self-esteem from, a, a sense of doing the right thing, being virtuous, being kind. And this gives a real uh, security, a feeling of inner security and um, confidence inside the mind. So the Buddha actually said what the worldly ones say is happiness, the enlightened ones say is suffering. And what the enlightened ones say is happiness things like renunciation, which has a bad rap, the, the worldly ones say is suffering. <laughs> is that true? Is it happiness or suffering to renounce? Yay! It is, isn't it? Like, that's why we make New Year's resolutions, I reckon. You know, because it actually helps us to feel good when we make a decision and we decide to abstain from something and then we manage to do it. We feel much freer because we know we're not controlled by that thing. We know we can be happy without it. You know, I often think when I see people, <laughs> it might be me soon because we just um, bought a monastery that's, a, a, at the moment, it's a large house. Um, but I used to look at these large houses that people have just for the sake of, you know, having a huge place to live for themselves and think, like, why do people need that? Like, why do they strive so hard to have luxury? And uh, over the years, I came to sort of think maybe it's because if there's a lack inside, and I'm not judging anyone because this is a, a, you know, a generalization, a huge generalization. But I think the more we lack inside, the more we sometimes need to compensate with things outside. And then we become used to a certain level of comfort and we find it difficult to do without. Yeah. But some of the freest times in my life have been when I've had very, very little like less than seven kilos. It doesn't, it sounds like quite a lot, seven kilos, but when you're living out of a backpack, it's not very much. And all the clothes are kind of secondhand or just from other travelers, just handed down. And, you know, I remember going without deodorant for at least a couple of years until someone complained. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I didn't have uh, any of the normal kind of luxuries of life, maybe a toothbrush, but no kind of face cream or anything like that. And uh, no fixed plans and uh, there was such an enormous sense of freedom because I knew I was following a path. I could smell that it was leading somewhere really beautiful, not to my armpit, but <laughs> somewhere really beautiful spiritually, you know, a sense of possibility, a sense that there is uh, a path to walk. And that was beautiful. So um, <clears throat> I've tried to define this confidence in my own way, but I'm actually using various different quotes that I've found, and, which I think sum it up really beautifully. And the first one is by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And he says that the confidence uh, on the Buddhist path is a kind of willingness to accept on faith things that are currently beyond uh, the possibility to verify through our experience. Does that make sense? It's a bit convoluted, isn't it? 
but it's basically accepting on faith those things that we have yet to experience for ourselves. Yeah? So it takes a little bit of a risk, maybe a little bit of a gamble, but there is a process of verification along the way. And another aspect is that we are learning to embrace the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. So this means the qualities that the Buddha actually manifests. It's not him as a person, you know, because we don't know the Buddha as a person. He lived 2,600 years ago. But there are certain qualities that he was renowned for, particularly his wisdom and compassion. You know, he was designated the great compassionate one. And his wisdom was vast, especially into these Four Noble Truths and everything connected with causality, with birth and death, the reasons that we're here, the reasons we suffer and how we can be free. And his awakening, the fact that the Buddha was an awakened being, having some confidence in that, that it is possible, he was a human being, and that means we're a human being. <laughs> we're not so very different. If you look into some of the... Um, Pali suttas about the Buddha's past lives, it's surprising. He actually uh, was not so different from us in, in previous lives. You know, he, he also kind of resisted going to hear the teachings. He was much more interested in luxury and hanging out and having all the pleasures of the senses. And even in, the, in his last life, he had all these uh, different kind of, what do you call them? Not wives, but lots and lots of um, girls in the palace. I forget what you call them. But that was normal in ancient India, especially if you were rich. So he enjoyed all that, you know, but he realized the, um, the shortfalls and uh, even the danger in that, you know, that we're wasting our life, actually, if that's all we know, because eventually old age, sickness and death have to come. So seen in the context of death, these things sort of lose their... Um, they're enchanting sort of aspect. They're not enchanting to us anymore. So we have um, faith in the Buddha, in the qualities of awakening, and also in the Dhamma and in the Sangha, those beautiful qualities of truth, compassion, humility, selflessness, goodness, generosity, you know, all those beautiful qualities that we can recognize in our minds. And not only do we embrace those qualities as things to aspire to, we actually try to align our lives in harmony with them. So our thoughts, speech, speech and actions start to align with the, our deepest uh, held values, the most beautiful qualities we aspire to. So this is an aspect of confidence too. And another aspect which sounds a little bit more um, devotional perhaps, is the idea of confidence being, or faith being, a place to rest the mind. And again, resting the mind on those beautiful qualities. So they become a refuge, something to really uh, hold high above our head and in our heart. Ajahn Chah has a very lovely quote. He says, um, we learn to bow our hearts to the Dhamma rather than asking the Dhamma to bow to us. In other words, asking life, asking reality to bow to our own wishes, to our own wants, to our own expectations, because that's a recipe for disappointment, isn't it? And, you know, so, so much of the time we're very, um, we feel we're the centre of the world. <laughs> we are the centre of our world, isn't it? Mo you know, most of the time, as long as we don't keep trying to get this bigger perspective and remembering how we're connected to each and every one on this planet, including the, even the smallest of insects, you know, who depend on our kindness quite often to save their lives. So um, it's very beautiful. And I think an important factor of this confidence is to understand there is something to awaken to, you know. So often this word awakening is used these days, like, yeah, you have to awaken. Well, I am awake. Is that good enough? <laughs> I'm not asleep right now. But it's not just awakening to the moment. It's awakening to enlightenment as well. It's awakening to these qualities so that they're fully developed in our hearts to the extent that they crowd out, if you like, the hindrances, the, the qualities that pull us down. You know, we actually uproot greed, hate and delusion from our heart so they can't even arise again. And this is possible bit by bit. So I wanted to talk about how this confidence is experienced and relates to joy on the path, because I'm sure this is the most 
this is when it starts to get juicy, isn't it? When we start to feel some joy. And uh, one of the things I've noticed, you know, from the beginning of my path is that it gives a sense of empowerment and confidence and uh, um, energy. It even emboldens the mind to take risks, to take steps into the unknown, you know, which can be scary. But for me, that manifested as um, having no future plans, you know, being in Asia with just the backpack and no idea where I was going next, very little money, no return ticket home. Um, but I had a sense that there was something to find, something to discover. And I could feel it all around me in that culture, in Indian culture. And um, from the time I started meditating, I was 20 at the time, it was 1996, and now you know how ancient, I'm not that ancient, but I feel ancient sometimes. <laughs> um, so from that time, I noticed that I was less and less reliant on uh, having plans, on uh, what other people would think about my choices. You know, I um, found my own friends that were more aligned with the ways that uh, I wanted to live. And I had very little to my name. I eventually ordained in Burma, so that was the big sort of renouncing of householder's life. And we just slept on a, on a floor. I think it was a concrete floor with a little tatami mat, very, very thin. And you didn't even have a proper pillow. It was kind of more like a brick. Um, I'm sure I just kind of wrapped up some robes and, and slept on that instead because it was so hard. And uh, for the first months that I stayed there, all our food was cooked on wood outside because there was no kitchen. And the rice smelled kind of smoky, tasted kind of smoky, very poor quality. But I'd never been so happy in my life, you know. I really hadn't. I felt like I was back in the days of the Buddha with the most wonderful teacher who exuded loving kindness. And I had all this time to practice. And I could just sense where this could lead in the example that I was seeing, you know, my teacher and my fellow monks and nuns. Um, even though I hardly spoke the language, there was something much deeper than that being transmitted. It was almost being transmitted through examples of the Dhamma in practice. And it was one of the happiest times of my life. You know, we were sitting in the dumb hall, getting bitten by mosquitoes, sweating so much that you'd have a sort of bottom and leg shape pattern on your seat when you stood up at the end of the day because you just sweated right onto it. Um, but none of that mattered. Believe me, it's nicer to be cold, though. <laughs> so if you're a little bit cold, at least you're not um, in the humidity of Burma being bitten by mosquitoes. So it really gave me that sense of uh, freedom and possibility and a lot of um, ability to take risks. You know, there were times that the visa couldn't be extended and uh, I thought, oh no, now what do I do? But a friend of mine who was with me at the time, she said, don't worry, I know you haven't got money or anything like this, so I'll, um, I'll help you out. And uh, we travelled to Thailand and to various other places and I just had this really strong sense of, Wherever I'm meant to be, that's where I'll be. That'll be the best place for the practice. And with that kind of um, confidence and that um, positivity, trusting the goodness of my own intentions, it always did feel like wherever I was was the best place to practice. Because, I mean, how can it be anywhere else? You know, you can't practice in the past. You can't practice in some imaginary future. It's, this is what we've got, where we are now, and our lives have brought us here to this point. So if we can really trust that this is the best place, the only place we can practice, we can really put all our energy into that. So it's a source of inspiration. And for me, you know, meeting people who have walked a lot further on this path than me is um, incredibly inspiring and motivating. It gives me courage when I feel maybe like a lost, a hopeless case. It's good to share that, right? that I can feel like a hopeless case. Not often, to be honest, I'm coming out of those views, but, <laughs> but we all have our inner critic and our self-doubts. So, you know, we can all do this. We can all take a step. And that's all we have to do right now, just take one step and we're on the path. And of course, when you meet people who are um, a source of inspiration, they become a role model. And through that association, you have wise friendships develop. Wise friendships, the Buddha said, was the whole, is the whole of the spiritual path. 
because we need to have that positive influence around us to keep us on track. And um, yeah, it's a very, very powerful, uh, just a powerful source of joy in my life to have teachers that I can really trust. So it's much easier to learn when we can trust those who teach us. And another thing that I've noticed is that it gives a sense of inner security and inner refuge. You know, we can start to um, align our lives with our values and we can start to appreciate other people also based on their character rather than based on, I don't know, maybe the fact that they're funny or the fact that they're interesting or maybe wealthy or famous. These are not so important to us anymore. We start to choose the people we associate with according to their sincerity, their integrity, you know, the goodness of their heart. And then they become examples for us, right? And we can be inspired by them and, and live up to those standards. One of the things about my own teacher, Adrian Brown, is he always gives people his trust before he even knows you, really. He just kind of respects you and trusts you. And because of that, his monks and nuns and the lay people around him tend to live up to that trust because it's such a precious gift to be given. You know, most of the time in our lives, people are looking for our faults, pointing them out to us as if we didn't know. <laughs> and then we point them out to ourselves, don't we? Quite often before you sleep, oh, I did this again today. I shouldn't have done it. And, you know, how many more times do we need those things pointed out? But people who give us their trust, who give us their confidence, it gives us hope. You know, it's been shown, hasn't it, that children who are encouraged at school rather than put into detention tend to do better. They tend to thrive because somebody's seeing their potential and feeding that. So we have to feed one another's potential instead of feeding the fault-finding mind. And because of this, we start also putting our energy in the right places. This is one of the ways that confidence leads to joy. We start putting our energy into the things that really bring happiness instead of dispersing it into all kinds of distractions and things that don't go very far. And again, that's virtue, isn't it? That's, um, you know, looking at what you can change in this world as well and not spending too much time trying to change things that are beyond our control, whether that's in oneself or in another person. You know, we can do that so much of the time. And we forget that often the biggest kind of cause of change is um, the way we relate to life. Rather than trying to fix it to be just as we want, maybe we can look at it in a different way. Maybe we can look at the, the beautiful aspects or um, qualities in our partners instead of the ones that irritate us like mad. You know, or, or in our parents as they get old, it takes a lot more patience especially if your mother or father start to repeat themselves all the time and, you know, <laughs> don't want you to help them all the time in the way you think they should be helped. And instead, just recognize that, wow, you know, this is the person who's given me life. This is the person who's wiped my bottom when I was little, or wiped up my vomit. <laughs> and they're still here for me. What, how precious is that? You know, how wonderful. I remember just a week ago sending my mum a message just saying, I haven't really got anything to say, but I just want to say hello and I love you because you're still there and I'm so lucky you're still alive, you know. Because she lost her mum when her mum was only 58. And uh, it's been a cause of enormous sadness for her ever since, I think. So I do like to celebrate the fact my mum's alive. And, uh, you know, before it's too late, before she's about to die, because we don't know. We really don't know. She was actually diagnosed with high cholesterol re recently, and she's only small, really skinny, um, but apparently it's very, very high. And um, we don't know, you know, the sicknesses that we carry in our body or that other people carry. We don't know how long we have. So to really, really value people that are there and to try to look in different ways at life. And then another really beautiful aspect of the confidence, of course, is that it helps us to take, like I said, those steps on the path. And it's so close to a virtue. You know, when we're confident in somebody or something or the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, we aspire to be like that. And we start practicing sila, virtue. We start refining our own conduct, taking inspiration from them. And one of the um, aspects of virtue that's often very underrated is actually the absence of remorse, the absence of regret. 
looking at what we haven't done wrong. <laughs> and again, this kind of goes against the type of tendencies we have to want to be perfect and to think we have to do something big. How about noticing that today you haven't killed any insects, hopefully? Not intentionally, anyway. And OK, you took some chocolate, but not too much. Maybe you stopped yourself before saying something unwise or potentially hurtful. These are all beautiful things and there's a happiness to that. There's a lack of guilt, uh, a clean conscience, which helps you sleep at night deeply and peacefully. Yeah. So the Buddha said, celebrate that, see it, notice it as an absence of regret and see the happiness associated. Of course, another side of uh, a sila is the active participation in doing good. It's not only abstaining from things, but it's using speech in ways that heals or in ways sometimes that calls out injustices in the world. I was telling Marianne actually earlier that uh, yesterday on the train there was this two uh, girls, they were students, I'm pretty sure they were Indian because I used to live there and they were speaking in Indian language. And uh, they got on and put all their bags on the table, which meant I had no space to do anything. <laughs> and then they promptly went to sleep. <laughs> it made me laugh, I mean, because this is kind of how it is in India too. People go to sleep ev everywhere and anywhere at any time. Uh, <laughs> but then when the ticket collector came round, one of the girls pretended to stay asleep and he practically had to shake her about three times to get her to wake. And oh, that's a bit strange. And then she tried to show her ticket and it was uh, not the right ticket for the journey. It was three days old. So then some other excuse and she paid. But then he came to the other friend and she had different excuses like the app didn't work and this and that. And then she tried to say she'd got on somewhere else. And I remembered when she'd got on because she'd asked me a question. And I said, oh, you told me you got on at such and such a place. <laughs> And afterwards I told Marianne and she said, oh, you got involved. I thought, yeah, that's true. Should I have done that? <laughs> but something about me instinctively had to correct what I saw was untrue. And I don't know if that was right or not, but I kind of extended that to things like injustice in my mind and thought, well, someone sometimes has to speak out. And to be honest, it wasn't trying to incriminate anybody. It was just I saw something that was said that was untrue and that just changed the energy on that train to one of mistrust, the opposite of confidence. And earlier on in that journey, I was having the opposite perception. I was thinking, you know, there's people on this train from all over the world, speaking different languages, sitting really close, squashed in the aisle, and we're all getting along. There's no arguments, there's no disharmony. It's kind of amazing how people accommodate one another. But then when this happened with these two uh, girls, especially the second girl, it sort of spoiled that a little bit. And suddenly there became an atmosphere of slight mistrust. In the end, she bought a ticket, but she only bought it part way and she didn't get off at the stop she said she would. <laughs> and it made me realise that confidence and trust is not just in our own virtue, it's also in other people. Because as soon as um, that happens, we lose our trust in those around us as well. And this does spoil the joy, doesn't it? It actually does spoil the joy. But anyway, just a, an anecdote. But when we actually um, live lives of truth and use our speech in ways that's true and gentle and skillful and motivated by love, it has great potential to bring people together, even to unite those who are divided from each other. You know, to use our speech as harmony bringers, makers of peace, the Buddha said, you know, to speak words that are worth recording, that go to the heart, that uplift the heart, and that you can trust. Speech that's timely too, you know, maybe that wasn't timely of me to say that yesterday, I don't know. But uh, we try our best, you know, and we can use speech to bring about great good in the world. Similarly, you know, it's not only about not killing, but it's about protecting life. It's not only about not stealing, but being generous, like being generous more than you have to for no reason at all being generous even to people you don't like or you don't know you know if you haven't got much material wealth you can be generous with your time you can serve you can um, engage in social work you can work for extinction rebellion or for crisis over christmas so many ways we can we can give and uh, it's been shown you know that serving giving is one of the best ways to overcome depression why because it energizes and brings joy to the mind. 
it takes us out of our own narrow self-preoccupation and into a bigger sense of connection with all of life and with people who are struggling that someday could be us, you know. It's not really the case that there are people in houses and homeless people. It's just that at this moment, those people may not have a home. That could be us, you know. We don't know what might happen. In fact, for monastics, it, we are known as the homeless ones, but then we have to get monasteries to live in and <laughs> we become housed ones instead. But it changes all the time. And then also, of course, you know, another aspect of sila is to just virtue, is to live simply, live frugally, live contented lives, lives that don't drain the earth's resources, don't take more than our share. And in meditation too, you know, we can bring forward these beautiful qualities of sila, of virtue, in our minds. We can practice loving kindness. You know, we were doing a little bit of that this morning, trying to add the kindness to the way that we're aware. But also we can do formal practice of loving kindness where we build that quality up by generating loving thoughts, loving intentions and, and start to share some of this uh, goodwill with other people who need it, even with people we don't like, people who've harmed us. And another way of bringing up this joy in our meditation is to actually reflect on our own goodness. Does that sound kind of weird and egotistical? <laughs> It's a very important and popular practice in, uh, in Buddhist monasteries. Uh, I don't know where else it's taught, really. Um, maybe in some lay communities. Is it taught maybe in the insight tradition a little bit to bring up your own goodness and reflect upon that? And the purpose of that is not to give yourself a big head. My teacher always says it's to give you a big heart, which is a bit corny. But anyway, that's what he says. And I think it's true. And the other reason is because we're starting to learn how kindness feels by bringing it up, by bringing up a time that you were generous or a time that you restrained yourself or even something as humble as admitting a mistake, you know, accepting a mistake or a weakness that you have. How did you feel at that time? And you notice there's a feeling of integrity, there's a feeling of rightness somehow, there's a feeling of gladness that you did that thing. And this is just simple cause and effect. So it encourages the mind to do it again and again. And in this way, we can really energize and empower the mind. So the Buddha said that this confidence is actually one of the um, five indriyas. It's the first of these five indriyas, which mean um, spiritual powers or spiritual friends. And that leads to energy. That leads to mindfulness as well. And it's only an energized, mindful mind that's happy, you know. When you're tired, when you're kind of dull, there's not a lot of happiness there. But when the mindfulness starts to develop, when the energy starts to arise in the mind, then there's a sense of gladness, a sense of brightness, and the mind is uh, off in the meditation. It's off into deep meditation. So, so it can start from there. So with these words, I would like us to... Um, <coughs> Meditate for a while and see if we can bring up some inspiration, some gladness to start off the, the practice. So please uh, get yourselves comfortable. <clears throat> Have a little stretch. So just to remind you that these meditations are optional, so there'll be some guidance, but only follow it if you wish. And at any time, if your mind becomes quiet or if something else comes to mind other than the guidance, then please allow your mind to follow that, that direction. Whatever is nourishing for you.
So once again, gently closing your eyes if that's comfortable for you. And just gently landing in your body on this cushion or chair. Perhaps feeling the steadiness of your posture. Noticing where the body is in contact with the ground or the chair. Feeling held. Grounded and steady. supported by the uprightness of your spine. Your head supported by your neck, no need to hold. Relaxing the brow, the jaw, the mouth. And allowing all the muscles, the skin, the flesh, just to hang, to relax. Supported by the bones, the spine ground, as if everything were just melting down. Feeling the atmosphere, being created by us together as a place of safety, of warmth, a place where hopefully you're feeling welcome, you're given respect and trust without needing to perform. A friendship, a company that allows you to disappear for a while. To gently enter the realm of the mind, the heart. And to begin, I'd like to invite you, if you wish, to recollect a person who is inspiring to you in some way. Perhaps not in every way, but they have some quality that you really admire and respect. that gives you inspiration to develop that in yourself. And perhaps imagining this person nearby manifesting this quality so clearly
bringing gladness, uplift to your heart. See if you can get a sense of this person's presence or maybe a recollection of them engaged in a beautiful act of body or speech. And notice if that has any resonance that you can feel in your body, in your mind. Allowing yourself to feel inspired. Maybe even protected or loved. Just bathing in the warmth of this being's goodness. Bringing that goodness inside as a felt experience.
and with inspiration in mind, starting to notice some quality inside yourself that you can respect and admire. Maybe you too have some of this beautiful quality that you admire in the other. Or maybe you have a different strength. Perhaps a particular deed of kindness, an act of generosity or harmlessness, restraint comes to mind. Something you've done or abstained from doing fairly recently, whatever it is, that you can linger on and feel Gladness, confidence arise. You too have those seeds of awakening, seeds of goodness inside. And just allowing the mind to be at ease. Bringing an attitude of friendliness to whatever arises in the mind. For me right now, it's the breath, the breathing. Feels like a beautiful place to rest, to rest this tired mind. Nothing to do right now, except to simply be with this breath. Confident that each moment of kindfulness will lead to beautiful peace in its own time. All I have to do is just be right here now, planting the seeds for wisdom and compassion to arise in the mind.
So for those who wish, we're coming close to the end of the meditation seated. It's up to you if you want to carry on. If you're getting peaceful, if you're at ease. Before we finish, just gently checking through your body and mind. Noticing the feelings, sensations from the top of your head to your feet. Perhaps imbuing them with an inner smile of friendship, of care. of gratitude to your body and your mind for giving you this time to practice. Seeing if you can stay connected to your body or your breathing to this moment, even as you open your eyes. Coming out gently and if you need to stretch, also doing so carefully, quietly and having a little bit more time for some walking. So we have lots of time now. Um, The walking is for 30 minutes according to this piece of paper. (laughs) And uh, after that there's a tea break. So you don't need to use the walking period for your tea break if you can uh, wait. So see if you can maintain that continuity and uh, maybe we can ring a bell at um, 3.15 so that will give you the tea break and then there'll be some question and answers in here at half past three. Okay, it's half an hour for walking and then boom. someone going to do the bell? Yeah, thank you very much. Lovely. See, so forget about time.